Amigas, amigos de Mundo Ejecutivo, Smart Speakers y Amedir, bienvenidos nuevamente a una edición de 18 Minutos, un programa de liderazgo, motivación, marketing, finanzas, todos los temas que sean relevantes en el momento para compartir con ustedes, ya cumpliendo dos años de existencia. En esta oportunidad, de verdad, me complace muchísimo eh, estar en, con un gran, gran personaje hoy de lo que se refiere al mundo de la psicología positiva, que es el doctor Tal Ben Shahar. Antes de ello, les comento mi compañero y amigo Francisco Rodríguez, CEO y fundador de Smart Speakers, pues se encuentra atendiendo algunos temas de eventos, como le corresponde, por supuesto, y no estará con nosotros en esta edición, pero con mucho gusto yo, Mauricio Reynoso, director general de Amedir, conduciré la charla con el doctor Tal Ben Shahar una distinguida personalidad en el mundo, como les decía yo, de la psicología en general, pero muy particularmente en lo que hoy conocemos como psicología positiva, además de el mundo de la felicidad, las organizaciones, y para ello le hemos invitado para que nos explique y podamos conversar un poco más sobre el tema. Así que, sin más preámbulo, welcome Dr. Tal Ben Shahar to 18 Minutes. How are you? Thank you. It's very good to be here. I'm doing well. Fantastic, Tal. So I will start by asking you if you could tell us more about a positive psychology. What do you mean by, or what you we in the business world should understand by positive psychology? You see, um, historically, the whole field of psychology essentially revolved around the negative. So let me give a few examples. You know, if you go to a therapist, the first question that a therapist would ask you is, what's wrong? Why are you here? Uh, what do we need to fix? Or if you go to, um, you and your partner go to a, a counselor, the first question that you'll be asked is, what's not working in your relationship? What's not going well? Similarly, in organizations, a, a consultant usually asks, what are the problems in the team? What's not working in the organizations? Once again, what are the weaknesses and what can we fix? Positive psychology comes along, you know, just over, um, you know, 20 years ago and says, let's change those questions. Instead of focusing on what is not working, let's focus on what is. So if a therapist, a positive psychologist approaches me, you know, she would ask, what's going well in your life? What's working? Or in a relationship, a couple's counselor, what's going well in your relationship? You wouldn't be here if nothing was working. And similarly, in the workplace, a consultant would begin by asking, what are the strengths of the organization? What's working in a team? And it turns out, interestingly, that when you start with what is working, you, first of all, improve a lot more, and you also end up fixing the problems. Now, this does not mean we need to ignore the problems, the weaknesses, what is not working at the same time. What do we need to do? Positive psychology research argues we need to start with what is going well and build on that. Understood perfectly. Uh, once we are listening to you, I wonder if you will agree with the following. If I am working in my own personal development plan, would you recommend me to be aware about what my strengths are rather than my weaknesses and build my development plan based on my strengths and how can I leverage those strengths to be better, etc.? Yes. So first of all, this is a very important question to ask. And the answer, the short answer is yes. The longer answer is yes. And at the same time, do not ignore the weaknesses. You know, Peter Drucker, as always, was, was ahead of his time when he said that we need to focus on our strengths and manage our weaknesses. So if I can give uh, an actual example. So let's say, you know, I've been uh, working in a high tech company and because I do well in my work, I've been promoted and I become a manager. So from an engineer and operator, I become a manager. Now, very often the um, characteristics that are required to be a great engineer are not the same as those required to be a great manager. So let's say I have, you know, a great mathematical mind, a great engineering mind, but my weakness is uh, working with people or empathy or listening. To become a better manager, what I need to do is focus on my strengths, which is 
the ability to do mathematics, the ability to solve problems, and I need to manage my weaknesses. I cannot ignore the fact that I need to listen a little bit better or that I need to pay more attention to what people are doing or to their weaknesses and strengths. So manage my weaknesses and then focus on my strength, not give up on my abilities. Because what happens when I give up on my abilities and only focus on my weaknesses, my self-esteem, my self-confidence, and hence my ability to lead actually diminish. You know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, you, you look at a soccer player. And let's say that soccer player can kick the ball extremely well, but he's not very fast. Now, that soccer player, to become better, mustn't give up on kicking because he's already good at it. He must continue working and working very hard on kicking while attempting to become a little bit faster so that the weakness doesn't come in the way of expressing the strength. Mm -hmm. So going back to our manager, work on your empathy, work on your listening abilities, work on your interpersonal skills, manage those, and at the same time, continue cultivating your strengths, what you're good at. Yeah, fantastic. And that's also caused my attention on a particular concept as a result of something that I am doing and does not result as I expected comes some frustration. I have here and listened from some of your keynote uh, conferences uh, about resilience and anti-fragility. Mm -hmm. Once I am working on this and trying to do my best, etc., something happens and I, I don't achieve what I was looking for. But uh, tell us something and let the audience to, to listen directly from you. Resilience, anti-fragility, what those powerful concepts means in the current situation we are, because we are facing now a very adverse environment and challenging, etc. Yeah, you know, I started talking about uh, resilience and anti-fragility in particular as a result of COVID, when, you know, the whole world was basically thrown into a, a crisis. So what is anti-fragility? Anti-fragility is what I've come to call resilience 2.0. So let's begin with 1.0. Resilience 1.0, traditional resilience, essentially is a term taken from engineering. And it means that if you have certain material and you put pressure, stress on it, when you let go, it actually goes back to where it was before. So you take a, a ball, a rubber ball, you squish it. When you let go, if it's resilient, it simply goes back to where it was before. Or if you take that ball and you drop it, if it's resilient, it bounces back up to where it was be before. That's why when we talk about resilient individuals, we say about them, oh, uh, they bounce back, back from hardship, back from difficulty, back from stress. Resilience 2.0 or anti-fragility takes this idea a step further. So you take certain material, you put pressure on it. If it's resilient, it goes back to where it was before. If it's anti-fragile, it actually grows bigger, stronger, better. Or a ball, you drop it. If it's resilient, it bounces back up. If it's anti-fragile, resilience 2.0, it bounces back higher. So as a result of the stress, as a result of the pressure, of the hardship and difficulty, it actually grows stronger. Now, if you think about it, there are anti-fragile systems all around us and within us. For example, our muscles. What do you do when you go to the gym? You lift weights, you stress those muscles. As a result of that stress, over time, our muscles actually grow stronger, bigger, healthier. Why? Because we were designed, created to be anti-fragile. Or there are people who, as a result of hardships and difficulties, actually grow stronger, better, healthier. I mean, think about personal experiences. Many of the experiences that have made you who you are today were not fun, easy experiences. They were stressful, hard, sometimes even traumatic experiences. So what the science of happiness does today, and it's in most important role in today's world, with the uncertainty, with the wars, with the economic situation, with the political conflicts that exist everywhere just about, the role of the science of happiness, of positive psychology today, is not just to make us more resilient. It's to actually help us become more anti-fragile. 
So that these difficulties and hardships, and whether we're talking about a 10-year-old kid in school or a 50-year-old employee in an organization, if we become more anti-fragile, we actually end up growing from these difficulties and hardships. That's that's key, we grow. And, uh, you mentioned a, a word that um, is very popular now, especially among the human resources area, the human resources world, but also there are many leaders that are very curious and trying to understand exactly what this concept means in today's business world, is happiness. Is happiness and, and be happy is not only related to going to a party or <laughs> cutting a cake. No, no, no. Please help our audience and the leaders that are now watching us on, on, on YouTube. What really means happiness in the business environment, yeah. the impact that has may has in, in terms of business results and the role of the leader creating this environment of happiness in the organization. So, you know, the way um, I define happiness and the way we define it in all our programs, whether it's in our certificate programs, whether it's in our master's degree program or in our shorter programs, is that happiness is about whole person well-being, meaning it's not just about emotions. It's about much more than that. Specifically, it includes five different elements. The first element is spiritual well-being. That is about a sense of meaning and purpose. That is about being mindful and being present. These are ways of increasing spiritual well-being. Second, it's about physical well-being. That's about the mind-body connection. It's about exercise. It's about nutrition. It's about rest and recovery. Then there is the intellectual well-being. Intellectual well-being is about curiosity. You know, interestingly, research came out recently showing that... Um, People who are curious, who ask questions, are not just happier. They're not just more successful at work. They also live longer. So, Mauricio, you know, you know the saying, curiosity kills the cat? Well, yes. for a human being, it's the opposite. Curiosity <laughs> makes us live longer. Um, so, asking questions is, is very important. And, you know, we're talking about in our organizations about lifelong learning. So many benefits to being curious, to learning. Uh, fourth, it's about relational well-being. Number one predictor of happiness, whether it's in the workplace or at home. Quality time we spend with people who care about and who care about us. So um, kindness, that's another way of increasing relational well-being. And finally, we have emotional well-being. And that's about handling, dealing with painful emotions, which are natural in emotions like sadness, envy, anxiety, natural human emotions, as well as cultivating pleasurable emotions like joy, like hope, like gratitude. So we have spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. That spells spire. Okay. Spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. Okay. It turns out that every one of these elements, when a manager, a leader cultivates them in an organization, increases them by a little bit. We're talking two or three percent. What you find is that not only job satisfaction goes up, your employees also become more innovative, more creative. Teamwork improves significantly. Retention levels. You know, we talk so much today about the, uh, uh, the great re uh, resignation that so many people are leaving the workplace. Well, you increase levels of well-being, whether it's spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, or emotional, by a little bit. People are more likely to stay in the workplace. Companies actually become more profitable, meaning happiness pays. It's a good investment for a company to, um, to put effort into increasing well-being. And again, not increasing well-being. Oh, my employees will smile more or laugh more. That's nice. But in a much deeper way, looking at the different elements, the spire elements of well-being. And there are, of course, interventions that relate specifically to increasing each one of these, whether you're talking the individual level or the group level, whether you're talking about a, um, a third grade class in a school or a team in an organization. So uh, this is uh, music to my ears, but 
let's say that I am in front of uh, the C-suite uh, or a leadership team. Now that I'm listening to you, is possible to have some uh, indicators to demonstrate that by working on happiness, you will receive and you will be you will see positive impact in business yeah. results. You know, Mauricio, the answer to your question is in your question. You need those indicators. In other words, you need data. Okay. And, um, you know, if I go to a, to the C-suite and, and I tell them, look, um, I want to make your employees happier. Some of them will say, oh, that's nice. Why don't you come for our Christmas party and, and talk there? You know, it's a nice bonus for the employees. But if I tell the C-suite, look, if you increase sense of meaning and purpose by 3%, your employees will be more committed. Engagement levels will go up. And here's the data that shows that that's translatable to the bottom line. Revenues. If I go to them and I say, look, if you think a little bit more about physical well-being, introduce a little bit more recovery into the day. And here is how you can do it. Your productivity will go up significantly. Now that becomes interesting. And then I'll be invited to more than just the you know Christmas party. Then it will be something that the C-suite will look at as a good investment, which it is. The key though is, and I repeat it to my students all the time, connect it to data, to research, both data that shows them the research that has been done. And when you are in an organization, look at the results and measure them. That's great because I, something that we are personally within Amateur is every decision has to be supported by data. And, and this is exactly what you are, are now reinforcing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's critical because, you know, right now it's um, very often being considered as, you know, the soft skills. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. soft skills are hard and um, <laughs> you need to look at hard data to Absolutely. verify that. Absolutely. I'm very sorry that the time is now over, but I really appreciate your willingness and always you're very kind. You are very open to support the HR community in Mexico and business leaders that are attending uh, this uh, 18 minutes program. We really appreciate that and looking forward to seeing you and having you again in one of our international conference in presence in Mexico City or any other a city within uh, Mexico. Thank you very much for your time, your ideas, and everything that you have already uh, collaborated to be happier in our business, in our world. But thank you very much for that. Thank you, and thank you all for the precious work that you do day in and day out. Amigas, amigos, nos vemos la próxima edición. Un saludo también de mi amigo Francisco Rodríguez, CEO y fundador de Smart Speakers, co-conductor del programa. Se despide Mauricio Reynoso, director general de Medir. Hasta la próxima. Muchas gracias.